Hey, Seuss, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's a pleasure seeing you again, man. It's been a long time. Yeah, I think the last time we saw each other was probably in 2019 at Investor Fuel, like in Dallas or somewhere like that. So it's good to catch up with you. We got a lot of same mutual friends and whatnot. So uh, glad to get you on the show here. I've actually listened to some of your other guest interviews on other podcasts to do some preparation for this. So looking forward to kind of hearing about your journey and the exciting things you're doing in the real estate space. So before we get into that stuff, I mean, give us a little bit about your background. Sure. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to be here as well. I have known you and I look up to you, man. I think you, you, since you were in the John Martinez program, yeah. I always remember listening to some of your calls and some of your content. It was amazing. So it's amazing to see your growth and happy to call your friend, my friend. Thank you. Likewise, buddy. So a little bit of me, very short. I studied electrical engineer back in Chile. I was born in Chile, raised in Brazil, moved to the U.S. about 10 years ago. And six years or so, I reread the Reach Dad, Poor Dad. And I was in a transition phase in my life. I had another business that I was looking to exit out of that business. And I was looking to buy and sell the highest asset that you can do. And I reread the book, got inspiration, went to a RIA, local RIA meeting. And that's it. Fell in love with wholesaling and, and flipping and the real estate and the benefits that comes from that. Uh, that's how kind of a very short version of how I got into real estate. So you came over here from Chile and yes. you had the other business. So you, you now you're in Miami, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I live in Miami. I had, it was an online business. We had a, a baby e-commerce. We, we would buy brands that were here in the U.S. but were not in Chile. We would represent them and sell them in Chile online. So my wife and I were managing that business from here, but it was in Chile. Uh and that was a, that had a little challenges. It was very hard to scale running a remote business the other way around. You, you, like typically people want to bring stuff from outside the U.S. and sell in the U.S. because yeah. the market is so big. I did the other way around. <laughs> hey, you, you're a reverse wholesaler. Yeah, That's but it was it was really good because there was several brands. I learned a ton into getting into that journey of the e-commerce. Uh, there was several challenges that we were able to overcome. I'm very proud. We eventually sold that business to Walmart Chile. Uh, amazing. So yeah, that was really good. That's awesome. So now when you were doing business in Chile, before we get into the real estate stuff, now is Chile in the same time zone? Cause it's just South or is it? Yes. Yes. It's just South. Yeah. So there's so, no, um, yeah. You don't have to worry. Like I've been to Asia before and like trying to get in touch with people over here is like a mess. Cause it's like the other side of the world, but yeah, you're just due South. So it's not like you have yes. to get up in the morning early or anything like that, you know? No. No, that, that, that was a good part. Yes. So let's get into your real estate journey. I've done some, you know, research before this. So I know that you had a, a kind of an aha moment in Miami when you did a deal. I don't know what the specifics, you'll obviously cover that, but the guy was on like three lists and you had like an epiphany. You're like, oh, wait a minute. He was like hard to get in touch with. So I'll have you tell the story. Was that your first deal or was that like your first like big deal? So it was this. Second deal that we did off market. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, because you were on the MLS first. Yeah. Yes, we 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 started doing deals from the MLS. Uh, our first coach, uh, he was a big MLS guy, so we found a little hack and we did three deals like in the first two months. Like, wow. Our our start into real estate is not the typical one that people took months to get a deal. We were very fortunate. Uh, we found a little hack. We mailed all the the listing agents that had a listing in the zip codes that we wanted and say, Hey, I'm an investor. I want to buy two deals by the end of the month. And we got bombarded. Like all phones and emails were crazy. We didn't know what to do with it. So we're eventually closing three deals from there. Spreads were very thin and we decided let's go off market. Right. And data was always my thing. I, I always loved data. So we started processing different lists and we wanted to do things differently. So we went specifically to county records downloaded from the sources. I always wanted to get the data from the sources. We had no idea what we're doing, right? I just wanted to have like, I have the freshest data, I have all the data points and then I can process it on my own. That was like the approach that we had. And the second deal that we did off market was a guy who was on a divorce list, tax delinquent, I think it was pre-foreclosure as well. Oh my gosh. And nobody was talking to the seller. Like the seller, literally the only person talking to them, I only, I, I, I'm very confident. We only got that deal because we were the only ones talking to them. Because again, we had no idea, right? Like we're learning. This is two months into our real estate journey. Yeah. We had a coach, so we had a lot of uh, shortcuts, but still we had no idea. 
And we eventually did almost six figures on that second deal. <laughs> and then we thought we we're going to be billionaires in, in a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Um, so how did yeah. you originally get in touch with the guy? Did you mail him, call him, text him? Like, how'd you get that? Call. It was a cold call. At oh, the very beginning, call. we started cold calling. Yes. Okay. Felipe, my partner, he had a sales background. He worked with call centers and different things. So he knew all the in and out of that. So that gave us a little advantage on that as well. Uh, and then he got it. It was a one call close. Like he got them an hour and a half call, contract signed in the first call. Again, <laughs> he it was very fortunate, man. We, we were being very blessed in the beginning of our careers. And reality is, it's not that easy, right? We just got lucky. It doesn't happen all that often, right? Uh, and and we started working with Gary. You, you know him, Gary yeah. Harper. Oh, he's a good guy. Big shout out to him. Anybody looking for a coach, highly recommend Sharper Solutions. Uh, we started working with him. And the second time he came to visit us, he saw our business. And we were struggling a little bit in our wholesale operation. We wanted to grow and scale, hiring, bringing new people, building the systems and process. And we were struggling a little bit. But he was always like pointing out, Guys, what you do with the data and the marketing is absolutely impressive. I've never done anybody do this. You should definitely do this for other people. And that's how we kind of created a secondary business for us uh, that was data marketing related. Yeah, no, and that's that's what you are best known for is the data, right? The And I love the name 80-20 because I, I personally follow the 80-20 rule every day. If someone just implements 80 20 like the principle in their life it, it, it's amazing it's almost like too good to be true you're like oh wow like this this is weird anyway so he sees that the way that you guys and the first point i want to make to the listeners is that you mentioned something that people don't like to do is you like to go direct to the source instead of using all these other companies that kind of uh like aggregate the data like core logic and, and you know all these big companies you like to go to the, the the source in this case would be what the county records is that yeah so when we started yes we, we started getting directly from every source that we could the freshest and the the direct as direct as possible right yeah some lists you have to buy through a vendor because they're not available somewhere but uh we went in downloaded all the parcels from our markets and then we went in and downloaded directly from the county records all the tax delinquency and started getting nurturing and building the database on our own and the the first like aha moment for us when we started deduping for skip tracing we didn't want to spend twice the cost on skip trace and this was before stacking was a thing i'm not saying we created it but in our eyes we were the first ones to notice in in, in our company nobody told us we realized wait wait a minute let's not dedupe let's stack them right let's Let's assign, and actually we did a variation of that at the early stages, we created a, what we call weighted stacking because an absentee owner cannot be compared to a pre foreclosure owner. Like the levels of the stress that they have can be the same. Like a seller could be in a high equity absentee, technically it's in two lists, yeah. but a pre foreclosure will perform that list all day long. 100%, there's more urgency in the foreclosure. It's Absolutely. Like and they either sell to lose their house or they pay the mortgage. There's no other, way, no, no other way around. An absentee owner with high equity, yeah, sure. It's it's more likely to sell than an average property, but it's not, it's 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 not something, right? So what we did, we created a ranking system uh, five years ago where just pulling out weights and we say, okay, free foreclosure is worth five points, an absentee is worth one and a half points. And we created this system that allowed us to really build this database of all the properties and, and rank them basically on who had more motivation or distress uh, in the eyes. So that's how we really got started. Interesting. So, and that, what that allows people to do is you could be a lot more strategic with your marketing, right? And I know we were talking offline uh, before we hit record and it's like the, the service that now with 8020 that you guys provide is the data and also the, like the prescription plan. You're like the data doctor, you know, you got the white coat on or whatever, and you got the, uh, all the, the, you know, your clipboard is all the lists, right? So, hey, Mr. Prospect or Mr. Client, you should be uh, mailing this list uh, this many times and you should be sending this. So you're able to kind of take the data and then take a game plan and then start to, you know, advise the clients what to do. You give them the, give them the, the tools to do it. So let's talk about the investor right now. Let's kind of make this up, the scenario up. And I know you have some questions for me. The investor who, you know, is established, you know, they're doing business, they're not brand new, they have a budget, they can spend money on marketing. 
they go in, they get the data, they get a bunch of data now, you know, from you, from wherever, and they, you, you want to give them a good marketing plan. Like, what would you say, you know, and I'll have you kind of take over at this point, but like, what would that plan be? Cause a lot of people, they might have a budget. And that could actually hurt them because they're spending all this money on on uh, a marketing channel that they might not need to do because certain prospects should get communicated, uh, you know, in different ways. Hundred percent. So, oof, there's a lot to unpack in there, right? So, <laughs> let me start by saying that I think what most people who are either listening to the podcast or or will listen to the podcast, right, is they either getting data from two different data so solutions. Either they get a data subscription, right? Where they get premium data ranked with, with how likely they are to sell a discount. Uh, there's many vendors out there that do that. And the other typical group are doing the data on their own, right? So they use a software to stack the list and they get different lists from different vendors and they try to put it all together, right? Yeah. But neither of those two solutions are providing you a strategy. Mm. Because, okay, now I have these data that's ranked. Let's say you're getting a data subscription. It's ranked, supposedly it's prioritized. What do I do with it? Okay, most people, what they do today is they mail every month to the entire list or they cold call whenever they can to the entire list or they text once every month whenever they can, right? So there's not really a plan to how to attack the data regardless of what you're getting. So um, our, our services has evolved over the years. We now have predictive analytics. We have machine learning algorithms. We still use some components of the, the, the stacking that we created, but everything that we do now, it's way more uh, efficient in a way to predict who's more likely to sell at a discount. Uh, but that's, if your goal is to get more deals from outbound marketing channels, great data is only 30% of the equation. Wow. Because if you get that data, and use it with a spray and pray or not really with a plan, you're not, you're going to get results. Everybody will get results, but it's not the most results that you can get. Right. So what we help our clients now, and this is what we're evolving into is we're giving you the data, but we're segmenting the data and building a custom marketing plan for you to execute. Like you said, Hey, this part of the list, they're super likely to sell at a discount, mail them every month, but there's a part of the list. There's not that likely to sell. Uh, at a discount, at least not now, why should you mail them every single month? Mail them every three or four months. That way allows you to expand your reach with the same budget, way more effective and efficient. No, that's genius, man. Especially too, because if you if you have the right data and the right prospects there that are statistically proven to sell at a discount, you can spend more money on the actual mailer. Send them a handwritten letter. You know, whatever the case might be, send them a you know, uh, the check letter, the one that has like the check in it, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We, you know, we, we roll with the same people. So you can treat those prospects differently and send them different messaging because you know that the probability of them selling at a discount is a lot higher. Right. And I see a lot of people, they're just blasting everyone, blasting everyone with a text, blasting everyone with a telephone call. And maybe they have a, a, a prospect pool of 10,000 and they're cold calling the 10,000 once a month. But really, if you deep dive into the data, like what you guys do, you have 2,000 people out of that 10,000 that are going to sell quick and you call them once a week, call them once a day, door knock so, them, whatever the case might be. So part of the list, and I'll give you an example that anybody can apply. Today, before closures are starting to, to stack up again, right? right? Yeah. If you can get a hold of the freshest source for before closure in your market, this is what we do. We call and text them consistently for 10 days in a row. All we want is get a him, all we want is get a hold of the owner. That's a win. Like don't think a, a lead, oh, I want to sell my house, I'm ready. Especially with that type of list, you just want to make sure that you connect with the owner and then you create a plan based on the conversation that came about, right? And don't give up on the first call because especially before foreclosure people, they're in denial. It's it's a it's a process, man. You're losing your biggest asset of your life asset of your life. And, and it's a big, it's a big hustle. You know this. So you want to make sure that you connect with them as early as possible. In my markets, we, we still invest. We have a sister company that we still invest. My partner runs that the, the business, but if we're not first, we're last. Right. And, so, and calling once a month, a brief foreclosure list is not going to make it. No, I would say call them three times a day for 10 days in a row until they pick up. 
that's how good that part of the list is, right? And we're able to predict other parts of the list are similar to those. And there, there's a second tier that we say, call them three times a month, four times a month. And there's another one, just call them every three months. Like there, you're just playing a little bit of the chances of connecting them at the right time. There's no real urgency there. 100%. Does that make sense? No, that makes a ton of sense. Because with the, the foreclosure, like you mentioned, like they're, you know, we've done the foreclosure deals and like, they are in denial, but then they become to grips with reality that they do need to sell. And then if you're not calling them every day, someone else might, and then you'll lose that deal to a competitor when you could have won it, right? So that is critical. What are your thoughts now? That was that, that made a ton of sense. What are your thoughts now on these other types of like vacant properties or tax default pro? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Because that that they're urgent because they're usually like paying for an asset or not paying for an asset that's not even occupied. Or, or the tax delinquency, you know, we've done some pretty big deals from that too, where like they didn't pay their property taxes, but it's not as urgent as a foreclosure because like there's a little bit more leeway, at least in my state. You know what I'm saying? So what are your thoughts on that kind of stuff too? So the first thing I would say is know your market better than anybody else. Exactly what you said. In some markets in, in Florida, tax delinquency can last five years. Yeah. Before they are seven yeah. years before they yeah. are at the verge of losing their house, yeah. right? So they have a lot of time, yeah. right? So it's different. So this is something that we learned over the years is every data point, and we're not only looking at distresses anymore. We look at a bunch of other data points like education, income levels, and other things. Oh, right? so you go into the... Oh, oh wow. well, we went deep. Yeah, we went deep. But the 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 point is the tax delinquent, for example, I'll give you this example. There is a distress that anybody can get a hold of. In some markets it behaves better than an out-of-state absentee, right? But in some other markets, an absentee owner is more likely to have a discount than the tax delinquent. But, and the only way that you can know this is knowing your market. Does it make yeah. sense? You yeah. need to understand how long every distress takes to affect the seller and, and build a plan based on that. Uh, that's one of the things that we did in the early days. We learned those things by testing and trial and error and, and, and every market will behave differently. 100%. But yes, yes. tax delinquency is a great list, but it might have a different timeline depending on the market that you are. So on that note, let me give you an example on a deal we just actually did from tax delinquent. You'll you'll like this one. It was it was very interesting. So it was actually from a text message, believe it or not. Uh, the lady come, ops in and my uh, Anna on my team was like, hey, I think this is a pretty good lead. You know, we knew like the, it was in Delaware. So it was, I was like, I knew the area and I was like, oh, this is, this is a good area. Like this, I've actually been to that town and I'm, it's right by the water. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we got something going here. So lead comes in, Brett goes to attempt to call her. She stonewalls him. She, she's like, kind of like, you know, cause a lot of these people are just procrastinators and that's the reality of it. They're just, they're procrastinating. They're kicking the can down the road. She's claiming it's a hoarder house. So we're thinking we're going into like a crime scene. She completely just goes ghost, right? And, and she's in our, like what we have in our sales system is that we have like a top 20 prospect list where it's like 80, 20, right? Like the 20 people nice. in our database who are most likely gonna sell in the next 90 days. So we like identify them and we we hit them like every week. So she goes Brett and I'm kind of like helping Brett out. I'm like, oh, we gotta get this. Like this lady's gonna do business with somebody. Like she has to sell, she hasn't paid her taxes, you know, distress, the whole kind of nine yards. So I actually got involved. I personally reached out to her like on my cell phone. Like I sent her a text. I'm like, Hey, Catherine, and her name's Catherine. I'm, I'm not going to say her last name. And I said, Hey, this is Greg. You know, Brett's been trying to get in touch with you. Would you be against getting on the phone tonight? So I sent her like a no orient, like a Chris Voss, no oriented question. She's like, I'd get on the phone tonight. So I get on the phone with her personally. Hey, what's going on? I know you wanted to sell, et cetera, et cetera. She's like, yeah, you know, I want to go to Texas and blah, 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 blah. I said, listen, I totally get it. I know you want to sell this house. She's like really embarrassed about the condition. So I set an appointment at the end of the phone call to have Brett go to the house. Okay. So now he sets, I set an appointment. This lady was ghosting us at this point. So we finally get her on the phone. She lets Brett into the house. He builds a great relationship with her. She's like, you know, really interested in selling. And all of a sudden an objection comes up. She's like, well, I think I want to get more offers. My sister wants to get more offers. So she was like, kind of like whimsical. Long story short, she goes back to Brett. She's like, I actually don't want to get any more offers. As long as you guys can pay for my moving truck to Texas, I'll sell you that property, right? So we assigned the property for 38. We created 38 grand out of thin air in the matter of three weeks because of a careful nurturing and kind of handling of the prospect because we knew she was going to sell, but it just was going to take an appointment 
And the appointment was hard to get, to get Brett in the door, to then get the relationship built, to then get the revenue, to ultimately help the lady move to Texas because she needed to sell that house because it was in shambles. So it's like, you got to treat these prospects the way they need to be treated, not the way you want to treat them. You know what I'm saying? No, man, you, 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 I was so excited to, for, for this podcast because of that, because I know you treat and you take these process very well, right? You, you said a couple of things that are very important to, to people. And I, I, I want to make, drive a point here. You treated a prospect and a lead very similar. Right. Because a lot of people put a lot of effort in the leads once they're in your system, when they say yes. And I would say you need to take the same approach, obviously, with different timing and different intensity with the follow up touches. But anybody who you got on the phone that you confirm it's an owner. It needs to be on a follow up sequence with you. It, I, I know is a not yet. Right. And you guys treat it that way. You identified the top 20 people who maybe say, said a maybe or maybe said a no, but you knew something was going on in there. You were still pursuing them until you finally converted them. I right. think that's a very important point. And the second thing is take that same approach and apply it to the prospects, the people that you haven't verified yet. Right. That's what we help our clients do is. Now that you have a bunch of people that you don't know, you don't have what, what the right number is. We just know there's a property that's very likely to sell a discount. Take that same approach based on how likely you think they are to sell a discount and create a specific plan for them because everybody's different. Everybody's going through a different situation. So exactly. amazing how you guys got that deal. Yeah. And it was like, we, when, when the deal was done, I mean, there was a little, it was a little rocky in escrow, but like, you know, cause she was like, kind of like whimsical, but like, you know, I was like talking to Brett after and like, you know, he did a great job converting her. He's amazing at, 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 at talking to sellers and converting, but like, I'm like, man, like if we didn't, cause I'm a little bit of like an aggressive guy. Like I'm not like a pushy person, but like, I'm very direct. Like I'm from New York. I'm very direct with people. Like I want to get to the point. I want to have an objective and an outcome. And like, she told me, she's like, I was a little uncomfortable when you called me. I really didn't want to do this, but I'm glad you ended up pushing me to get the appointment with Brett. Cause ultimately she needed help and she was procrastinating. Right. So it's like a lot, some of these distressed people, you have to nudge them a little bit, right? Because they have to take action and they don't want to take action, hence the condition of their property. But when you can kind of like, I call it the velvet hammer, right? Like you hit them with the velvet hammer, they eventually kind of come to grips. And then when they get into a good environment with, you know, your acquisition person or yourself and you can convert them and make them feel comfortable, you know, a lot of the times I've noticed too, like I hear this objection, like, oh, I'm getting seven offers from seven different investors. It's like a lot of times if they're going to do that, if they're going to get seven to 10 offers, it's just a commodity at that point. But when you're competing with two or three people, and I've done business in San Diego, New York, Delaware, you name it. Like if you're competing with two or three people and you're a really good salesperson, a lot of sellers, and I was telling this to someone yesterday, they will really assign value to the relationship, assuming the price isn't like astronomically different, you know, 10 grand, 20 grand, like a lot of people, it's like, it is what it is. But when you can really build that relationship with that prospect, even if you're competing with a couple people, if you lean into the relationship, sellers really value that. And people like, sometimes they have this belief, they build like, oh my God, there's three offers. I'm not going to win this deal. It's like, if you go in there and you have an intention to serve sellers, especially distressed sellers, you know, there, there's a lot of value that can come out of that conversation that people don't really understand. You know, I'm sure you see this a lot. Yeah. And to drive two points that you made, I think a very, very good point is one, how, how often are you seeing sellers that are not talking to anybody in your market? Do you come across some of those where yeah, they talk? Yeah, that happens. It happens not all the time, but it happens sometimes. But so I want to show something why it's important to get data from the sources, right? Because a lot of the data, there is some markets up to 40% of the data has a wrong format in one of the columns. What I mean by that is it could be a bathroom, for example, a bedroom. If you're buying lists and you're applying a filter to bedrooms, for example, by applying, I want three plus bedrooms or two plus bedrooms. There's a lot of properties that have blank or wrong format and they don't appear on those filters. So you're missing out on opportunities. And like those are dozens, dozens of possible columns that you're applying when you're buying data from different sources that is limiting the list that you get, right? We call them hidden gems. And we make sure to include those in our data process, right? Because you mentioned, oh, talking to two, three people. How good would it be if you, at 10% of the time, you were talking to somebody that nobody else is talking? Oh, it's amazing. It can still happen today. 
It still happens today. It's just that there's people are hidden because they don't show up in any list because last sell date is not recorded. Your build is not, like so many records could be missing. And every time you apply a filter, you miss it, right? Yeah, and uh, that's where the opportunities are, man. When you're the only game in town, I mean, it is just a lot better for obvious 100%. reasons, you know, because they don't have 100%. it in their mind. No, that's awesome. And the other thing that, that you said was targeting the message that you need to say to different sellers. I'll, I'll stick with the pre-foreclosure list because this is like the most a stressful event that they have a real deadline immediately to solve, right? We recommend being very upfront on your messaging with a foreclosure list, on your direct mail, on your text message, on your call. Open the call, say, hey man, I have your list banners here in my hand. In my hand. I wanna help you. How, have you thought, do you know? A lot of times they don't even know they, ha they are going through foreclosure yet because it was just filed. We're, we're the first ones to call them. Like we, we take pride on that when our wholesale business, uh, but, being upfront about it and starting up, they need that a little bit, right? The the other thing is a lot of the times, and you said this, the, the pinpoint between you and Brad, right? Yeah. We call that a CPR. If one agent can't close it, the other agent has a chance immediately. Yeah. And more often than not, you'll be surprised. They didn't like this person for whatever reason, right? Uh, and he opens an opportunity. Or when you can tag team, the lead as well. It's really beautiful. So oh, yeah. it, 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 we play good cop, bad cop sometimes. Like this just happened this morning. We were dealing with a guy and he was a complete ostrich and uh, he inherited the property. It's a great area in New York. And uh, I was a little aggressive with it because the long story short, the brother is the ostrich and the sister is like the shot caller, the big baller shot caller. And Brett was talking to the ostrich and I'm like, I, we got to get in touch with the sister because the sister is going to be the one making the decision. So I called the sister because Brett was dealing with the ostrich <laughs> and I was a little direct with her because like I was fed up with the ostrich guy. And, uh, you know, so she was a little upset with me. I, I could have done better. I'll, I'll admit it. Like I was a little bit too direct with her. I was like, hey, like what's going on here? You know, you know, blah, 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 blah. So Brett reached out to the sister afterwards and was like, hey, did Greg call you the other day? Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe I let him call you. Was he a kind of aggressive? Yeah, yeah, he was real. And like, you know what I mean? You, you, you get, you kind of go back. Okay. Well, listen, I'm so sorry for that. Listen, I, he shouldn't have called you. I'm the one, you know, and then you kind of can level the playing field and get the sale back on track, you know? So being able to tag team, if you have multiple agents or if you're the owner and you work with your team, et cetera, like I do, like, it's just a more efficient, efficient way to convert some of these tough sellers. Cause not everyone's a lay down, as you know, I mean, these people are tough. Only do that if you have a ranking system like you do, right? You have your top sellers. You're not going to do it with every single lead no. that come across and have two people. But if you know something is happening, you have them categorized. That's when you can focus more, right? The same with the list and the prospect side. You're not going to door knock every single property in your market. But if you know somebody's going through multiple owner passed away, foreclosure, you name it. Yes, it's worth door knocking, okay. right? But you can only do it with a certain type of period uh, seller. So. That's really what, what I think is the most important thing for real estate investors today is the, the, the days of getting a list and mailing every month or calling every month are over. Like data is tapping in and it's playing a big role. Having a strategy with the data is what really will make the difference and get it very granular on the type of message that you send. Like one of our, we encourage our clients to use what we call a targeted message, right? In the postcard, you can send something that says, hey, we specialize in catching up with that, tax liens, whatever is the situation. And it rotates based on the needs of the seller. So you're sending them the same postcard to everybody, but the messaging is different. It's relating to them. The same thing with the text message. You segment your data with pre-foreclosure. You have that on top. Like if they have pre-foreclosure, go, go over them. But create a message directly to connect with them, solve their problem. What is the benefit by talking to you? Not a generic, hey, I wanna buy your house. Yeah, th that still generate responses. It's better than nothing, but it's not gonna really increase your ROI. If you wanna take the most you can from your data, building good data with strategy and very granular on what we call tactics, right? Like the granular with the postcard, with the message, with the script that you're saying on the, on the call makes a huge difference. 100% that message market match. I mean, because people can see that and like, wow, this person knows exactly what's going on. And then all of a sudden, 
that gives you an advantage over the other person because there's obviously, you know, there's that, that ult, that, that connection that hasn't even happened before they called. Cause they see that you're like, you know, reaching out to them and there's, there's that, uh, that trust factor, right? Cause you, they almost feel like it's almost like you're in their shoes, right? Like you kind of, hundred percent. you, you just solve their problem, right? So the, ma- the initial message is not about you. Hey, I'm an investor. I, I, I do deals here cash and there. I want to buy your house. Yeah. Yeah. Cash is that's all about you. But if you frame it, it's about, hey, this is how we can help. It's a benefit to the seller, right? And when you make that message tailored to them, one of the things that we're just working on is we want to pair in the postcard, like to build credibility, include a testimonial, but a testimonial that is related to the situation that the seller is going through. So if they're going through probate, instead of putting a generic testimony, hey, I work with Greg, I saw my house was really good. Having somebody a, a testimonial that it was a probate solution. Hey, they helped me solve the probate. So, you, like those little things makes a big difference. Hundred percent, a hundred percent, bro. I know you had some questions for me. Uh, you wanted to like yeah. reverse role. Yeah, reverse I wanted to see that because I saw you you did a course on direct mail, and I know you have your processes dialed in. Uh, what are you doing with your data? What are you doing with direct mail? Are you applying any of these sequences? Are you applying? Frequency, because another thing that I see happen very often is people send the same postcard month after month after month after month, trying to get better results. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So that's a great question. So the way that we do the data is we we have the data, you know, we have the niche data and we have the broad data. The broad data is like, you know, absentee, unknown equity, you know, hot senior owner stuff. That's like not really a pain point necessarily. Of course, there's deals on there. And then we have our niche data, which is like tax default uh, pre-probate, which is, they just passed probate is the estates open and they're, you know, working through that. So what we'll do is we mail the niche data more, obviously, cause that's more of a higher probability of selling. And then we'll, we'll, we, what we do is we'll, you know, cause there's the niche data. There's not as there's, there's way more broad data than niche data, right? So we'll mail that niche data monthly. Right. And what we do is we'll update the data. So we'll get new data. We'll take that new data. We'll add it to our, you know, existing campaign that's running. And then the way that I do with the messaging is I never want to send the same postcard over and over again, because that's just going to get bland and and it's going to blend in with the mix of everyone else. So what I do when I run my direct mail campaigns is I'll take like for camp, like cycle, I call it, I do it in cycles. So like cycle number one, I'll have a postcard, right? So the post and what I do, and I do this like very detailed and strategically is I'll have a, a screenshot of the postcard I decided to send and I'll take the screenshot and I'll stick it in a Dropbox link in my campaign. And then I'll be able to see like cycle number one, this postcard got sent out, right? So it's like already there and systematized. And I'll track all the KPIs, calls, response, you know, deals, contracts, revenue, et cetera. And then cycle number two, I'll test a different postcard, right? I'll test a different postcard. And then I'll measure that the stats from cycle number two against cycle number one. And I'll see which postcard triggered better or worse response. And then I have data from now cycle number one and cycle number two to then do cycle number three, right? So that's how we kind of run our our direct mail system. And then at the end of the day, like I'm, you know, a big just ROI guy, like how much did we spend? What was the amount of units that got sent out? How many calls came in? And this is the thing that people don't track or don't track enough. Just because you got a lot of calls doesn't mean you're going to get a lot of deals from it, right? So I look at the ratio of calls to net leads, right? So if we got X amount of calls, how many of those calls were net leads? And we have that all systematized in our CRM. So then I can say, I can look at the stat and I can say, oh, wow, we got 50 calls, but we only got 15 net leads. Hmm. There might be a problem here where like the people who call in are removals or whatever the case is. So I look for the net leads and then the net leads will flow into contracts. Obviously offers have to get made, but that's a separate metric we track. That's a company wide thing. And then out of the contracts, we look at the revenue or if we keep it as a rental, we treat it as revenue. It's like we look at the equity position we have. Same shit. Um, but that's how we like systematize our mailings with, with um, you know, being able that's to a, make decisions on the spot, you know, when we need to change it. That's awesome. And that's why I, I told you before, like I'm, I'm, I was excited talking to you because I know you had some of these systems already, right? I would encourage you to separate your data in three tiers, figure it out like what is the top, top ones and be more, even more aggressive. So those you want to mail every 30 days, we have, we start with a recommendation of 30, 60 and 90 day cycles, right? Like you said, and have with the people that are on the top, 
You can even send more letters more frequently. Letters are super expensive. It's three times the price of a postcard. So you only want to spend strategically there. You're probably doing some letters as well, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. That's all. Yeah. So, but the, the goal is to create a plan based on the frequency, the type of piece, and how often do you send a letter to? Because at the bottom of the of the list, you probably want to send a letter once a year only. You don't want to send a letter every. So if you're sending a postcard every three months, you send a postcard, postcard, letter, postcard for the year, right? And then you rotate the cycles. And, and it's amazing that you are already doing this as different designs and different type of messages because different people react to different people. The same conversation that we had about you and Brad connecting differently at a different level with the seller, the same thing happens with the postcard. You might send a check postcard to a, a very emotional person. You're going to say, oh, I don't know. no, out. But if you send a very emotional postcard with a couple's testimonial, very, very emotion driven, right? You're triggering a different type of seller to respond. So altering, being intentional with your postcards as well. Like I'm trying to drive uh, to get a response from a driver with this mail, or I'm trying to get a response from an emotional person from this mail. So there's a lot of layers that you can layer into. This is what we call the tactics, right? It's very granular, but if you do it well, you can boost your ROI significantly. 100%. You're going to love this story. All right. So this, this is recent too. Probate mailing. Mm -hmm. Guy calls in. It was right at the end of the day. So my lead manager was already done for the day. So I, I was actually right here currently in my, in my office, uh, bedroom slash office. I call the guy back myself and he goes, um, and we, we, the, the, the end of the story is we assigned it for 37,000, but this is how it happened. He says, I got like eight letters from everybody. You're the only letter that said we can close on your timeline. Every other letter said cash, seven days, 14 day escrow. He's like, your letter said we can close whenever we want. And I need to have my brother relocated and we can't be under the gun to get out of here right away. That's why I'm calling you. Brett goes on the appointment, gets the contract assigned. It's in escrow for 37,000 now because of the freaking copy in the letter. It's like, that's that's a real like revenue from a freaking word in a letter. It's just crazy how the small hinges swing big doors, bro. That's exactly like the targeted messaging, right? So if you can segment your data, and this is what we help our clients to do is we give them, we have a, a little feature we call targeted messages where you pair different indicators in the database with different messages. So it makes super easy for the mail house to include those. But those little things... It's an extra 5%, an extra 10% on the calls. And bottom line is significant because every deal, extra deal that you get is 30, 50K, right? So it's 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 very good. I'm, I'm super impressed by what you're already doing, man. Uh, uh, you're on the right track on the strategy, data, and tactics. Uh, so kudos, man. Thanks, man. So let's talk about this as we start to wrap the show up. So if someone wanted to become a potential client of 8020, right? You guys have a great business, great reputation. You guys are in the, the big masterminds. You guys provide a lot of value for your clients. Let's just do this. Well, at the end, we'll t tell people how to get in touch if they want to apply. But before we do that, what does the process look like for a prospective client, assuming they're like, hey, this is something I want to do? Yeah, so let me start by saying that we primarily focus on professional real estate investors. What I mean by that is people that are already doing 40, 50 deals a year, right? We, we like the clients that take the most of our services are the clients that have a team around that they're already built and they want to maximize the return on investment that they have, yeah. not try to get the first deals. Uh, that's why I wanted to cover some of these points with you because we, we want to help the, the folks that are listening to the podcast. They're trying to get to a consistent deal flow know your market, focus on the brief foreclosures, and you're going to start getting more deals frequently, right? Once you get there, you can connect with us. Once they connect with us, we have a demo call. We try to understand what their really needs are and if we see if we're a really good fit for them because we're not a solution for everybody, right? Uh, and we want to make sure that we, with the clients that we work with are going to be for the long run because we put a lot of effort on our side to make sure that we deliver the absolute best product for them and want to make sure they're a fit. Um, once they start onboarding with us, the first thing they do is we build a very strong buy box, right? Like we, we have 10 criteria that we ask for you to give us on what your preferences are in your market. But we also help you by reverse engineering your deals that you've done in the past so you can really zone in. Again, the 80-20 principle, identifying the 20% of properties that generated 80% of the revenue. What do they have in common? Because if you look at your deals, I can almost guarantee 
you will see that 20% of the deals that you've done in the past generated 80% of your revenue. And they all have some things in common. Once we identify that, we look at your market as well, what's happening in your market. So we complement your expert knowledge of the market, the reverse engineering of your deals and reverse engineering the deals that are happening in your market to build a very solid buy box for you. And then from there, we rank the properties and then we give the, the, the monthly list and the monthly recommendations custom built to your needs. So if you send 10,000 postcards, if you send 20,000 postcards, we adjust that marketing plan based on your needs. That's amazing. It's a very uh, systematic, strategic way. And I think this can help a lot of people if they want to get to the next level, especially with just being able Because a lot of people, you know, they, they have the ability to spend the money on marketing, but they're just, it's like, you know, it, it's like they're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and they're just, it's you're getting lucky, pray. right? Spray and pray. Yeah. It so for many, many plan, years. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, it's, it's when you can have a plan and you can be like targeted and intentional, like we shared a lot of examples in this, in this podcast show today, you're just going to get better results. Right. And I, I tell, I tell Brett all the time, like, is this a 95, five prospect? Like what's going on with this prospect? And like, we know when they, when they're, when, when we get a lead like that, we're like, Oh, drop everything you're doing appointment, three hour appointment, whatever it takes. Cause the, this prospect is going to make the revenue. And it's like, when you have enough experience, you can, you can kind of like, you, you can tell when you got a good one on the line, you're like, Oh yeah, yeah. This is a, uh, this sounds like a house that I've bought in the past, you know, and you could kind of rinse and repeat. And that's how you just get better and better and better and, and grow your business. So if people wanted to get in touch and reach out about your service, what is the best way for them to do that? That's our website. Book a call with us. We'll love to see if you're in the right uh, journey, part of your journey, right? And if we are fit for you, uh, there is many data vendors out there we believe that we stand out by not only giving the data, but also helping you with the strategy and the tactics, the actual message that you should be sending the script. We have a ton of experience and we've done this for many, many years for other professional real estate investors. We learned a ton. Like we're, we always say we're in a very fortunate position because we work with the top real estate investors in the country and it's a learning experience every day. We're providing a service and at the same time, with the feedback loop that we build, we're always learning. So we're always improving our processes. 100%. So, yeah. That's awesome. 8020rei.com. Yes. The website. There's no, is there a space in between that? Or is it 8020rei.com? 8020rei.com. And then how do people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? You have like a social media profile? Facebook is the best way to, I'm not too proactive on social media. I'm not the, the influencer type, uh, but I do respond to my messages. So somebody wants to reach out to me, Facebook is probably the best band. Okay. What's your Facebook? Uh, first name, last name, Jesus Toledo. Perfect. I think it's 23 at the end of it. <laughs> we'll make sure we put that in the show notes. So, hey, Jesus. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'm not sure uh, okay. which one is my specific user, but yeah. <laughs> well, we'll make sure we have that in the show notes. And I appreciate you coming on today's guest. This was a value jam-packed, tactical, strategic episode. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great day, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And glad to connect with you, man. You're doing awesome things and keep going with your podcast. It's amazing. Thank you. Oh.